thanks. We are going to cry unto God and say, Father, your word says that in your presence there is fullness of joy. Father, I have come to your presence, Father, this morning. Father, let my joy be full in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, don't let me leave this place without your word, Father, coming to me to make my joy to be full. Father, make my joy to be full in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I have come, Father, to meet you. And I know, Father, that your presence, Father, is here with us. Father, in this sanctuary, in this auditorium, Father, make my joy to be full. In the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. We are grateful. We are grateful, oh Lord, for all, for all you have done, for all. Hallelujah, we are grateful, oh Lord. We Father and our Lord, we, your children, have come to say we are grateful unto you for all that you have done for us as individuals, as families, and as a church. Father, receive our thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we have sung unto you. We have given you praises. We have prayed unto you. Father, accept our praises, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. My Lord and my Savior, we have come, Father, so that you can speak Father, to us. Father, this morning, Father, speak to us in the mighty name of Jesus. Let bodies be lifted in the mighty name of Jesus. Let souls be saved in the mighty name of Jesus. Everlasting Father, I yield myself unto you for you to use as your mouthpiece. Father, let me not speak of myself. But let me speak from your throne of grace. Father, this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. And let your words, my Father and my Lord, glorify your name in the life of your children. In the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Thank you, choir. God bless you. Good morning, church. In the next 20 minutes, we will be listening to the word of God. And I pray that the word will profit us in the mighty name of Jesus. Our team for the month, and we are all familiar with this team. <clears throat> Please don't mind my voice. It's quaking. But God will touch it in the mighty name of Jesus. The theme for this month is the vine and the branches. The, bra the vine and the branches. And our topic is based on the theme, the vine and the branches. Our Bible text is taken from John chapter 15, 1 to 8. John 15, 1 to 8. And I read, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Please, I encourage us. So please follow this reading of this Bible passage. It is deep, and I know we are familiar with it, but God will reveal a new understanding to you as we read this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, it takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, it prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean. 
because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That is the Bible passage for the team for the month. I am divine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Verse 6. If anyone does, does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. That shall not be our portion in the mighty name of Jesus. I say that shall not be our portion in the mighty name of Jesus. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. <clears throat> if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. That shall be our testimony in the mighty name of Jesus. Verse 8, the last verse. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. God will make us his disciple in the mighty name of Jesus. That Bible passage is loaded and it is self-explicit. And it is my prayer that you and I will walk in line with the words that we have read in that Bible passage all the days of our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. It is important to understand and assimilate every word that is said in this Bible passage that we just read, which is basic and fundamental to a successful Christian journey. You know, Jesus used the analogy of a farm, the farmer and the plants, you know, to aid our understanding of this very important life-changing concept, you know, which we all sign to as believers, you know, at our, during our salvation. There can be a farm without the farmer. Is that possible? It's not possible. And the plants cannot survive without the stem to tap nutrients from the soil. There's nothing, the plant cannot be planted without the stem. And that is what Jesus Christ as the vine is to us and we are the branches. This is the relationship between God, Jesus, and us. We are basically told in that Bible passage that there's nothing we can do on our own, or of our own, without Christ. You know, thank God for the hymn that we sang that assured us that Jesus is our friend. And as a true friend that he is, there is nothing that he cannot do for you. All you just need is to abide in him. This is a proven fact in our lives. And I know I have witness in the house that you are what you are, not by your effort, but because you have Jesus Christ in your life. There is nothing that you can do. I said there is a need to assimilate every word in the Bible passage that we read. That is John 15, 1 to 8. And we know that the meaning of assimilation is making something part of you. Or being part of something. You know, when you assimilate something, you, for instance, if you get to a new community, you want to assimilate their culture. You want to be like them. The passage is emphasizing to, that we should make ourselves part of Jesus and Jesus part of us. You know, throughout that John 15, Jesus was telling us, reminding us that we should abide in him. That we should abide in him. We should abide. He kept repeating it, meaning that we have to be ingrained, ingrained in Jesus. There's this Yoruba adage that says, you know, for the benefit of the non-Yoruba speaking people around us, you know, what it basically says is that when a leaf stays long enough in a bowl of soap, that leaf turns to soap. Especially for the elders, I'm talking about the black soap air. This proverb is true of us as Christians and believers. But the difference is that our transformation is instant, made possible by the Holy Spirit as salvation. You know, uh, that our trans once you 
accept Christ, at that point in time, you are transformed instantly. And I know I have witnesses in the house. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is the instant transformation, you know, that we experience at salvation. However, in the process of time, we become better and stronger, you know, as Christians. As we abide in Christ through the study of the word of God and living the word. That is what makes us a better and stronger Christian. We grow spiritually as we progress in our work with Christ in sincerity and in truth by continuously studying the words of God and being obedient to the words of God that we study. This is where that Yoruba adage comes in. That the longer you abide in God, you know, the more you increase in the knowledge of God, the more, the better you are as a Christian, the stronger you are as a, as a Christian. And this is where lies the problem with us as Christians? Many of us fail to study the word of God and leave it. No wonder Paul, you know, made an observation in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. He says, and I'm reading from the message version. He said, by this time, you ought to be teachers yourself. Yet, ere I find you need someone to sit down with you, and go over the basics on God again. Starting from square one, baby smick, when you should have been on solid food long ago. There is no one that will abide in Christ by studying the word of God, by living the word of God, that will not grow spiritually. If you are doing it in all sincerity, Jesus will make you a better person. Meek is for beginners, inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have, who have some practice in telling right from wrong. That passage serves as a reminder of the importance of spiritual maturity. As you abide in Christ, you mature spiritually. And the ongoing pursuit of deeper understanding in the journey of faith. There is no how you can you know, get deeper understanding except, you know, you study the word of God. And by so doing, you increase in faith. It challenges believers to move beyond spiritual infancy, partaking of solid food, and actively engaging the transformative truths of God's word. And for this to find expression in our lives, that is why Jesus likened the relationship between God himself and us as believers to a farmer and his vineyard in the book of John that we read. The vine dresser is God, the vine is Jesus, and we are the branches. And we all know that a vineyard is a plantation of grape vines, typically producing grapes used in winemaking. And for those of us that grew up in the village, we know you can relate with this analogy used by Jesus. The farmer as vine dresser takes care and intentionally nurtures the vine and the branches planted in the vineyard to produce good fruits for the harvest. A farmer is passionate about his farm, that he will do anything to see his plants, you know, grow and produce good fruits. This is how passionate our God, you know, the same way our God and Jesus is passionate about us. That's why Jesus was passionate in that Bible passage. Keep reminding us that we should abide in him, abide in him, abide in him. And it is by prayer that we will abide in Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. I said it is my prayer that we will abide in Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. God loves us to the extent that he gave his beloved son to die for us for our eternity. He was willing to do anything to see that we are not destroyed by Satan. That's why there is always joy in heaven over a sinner, you know, that repents and accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And this is speaking to us this morning. What's your contribution to soul winning? That is part of the ways of abiding in Christ, which is the most important way of bearing fruit, you know, and much of it. 
Without this care and nurturing, the vineyard will become wild and wheels will spring up to compete with it for the nutrients necessary for survival. So that's why we have to show interest in so winning so that we can go into the world and win you know, souls unto the kingdom of God. We are nurtured to spiritual maturity by Jesus, who is the word of God that we study as the true vine. But this morning, Jesus acknowledged this much in the verse that we read. And still on the farm, we have an understanding of the relationship between a vine tree and its branches. And even established the fact that the tree cannot come to exist without the farmer. It is also a known fact that the branches cannot exist without the tree. It is absolutely impossible. So to stay nourished, we have to stay connected to Jesus Christ. Any attempt to extricate ourselves from the vine portends grave danger, which can lead to destruction ultimately. So we have established that background. And during the course of the month, we have had sermons, we have had teachings on benefits of staying connected to the vine, of which the summary is the ability to bear fruits in diverse ways, but more importantly, in soul winning. And it is my prayer that we will all bear fruit as we abide in our Lord Jesus Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. So this morning, having been taken through various benefits of abiding, we shall be looking at those things that we do unconsciously that can take us away from the vine and make us not to abide in him and him in us. Things that we should not do, that we do unconsciously. That is what we'll be looking at this morning. And these are little, little things. I'm not talking about those big ones that are contained in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Media, can you please just help me display that? Oh, we can just quickly read that. But that is not the focus of this preaching this morning. You know, we all know Galatians chapter 5, you know, 19 to 21. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, 21, envy, murders, drunkenness, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. As believers, we know that we ought not to dwell in what is contained in that Bible passage, Galatians, that we read. Rather, we shall be focusing this morning on those little foxes, those little, little things that spoil the vine. According to Solomon chapter 2, verse 15, you know, it says, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. There's no way that we can be fruitful, that we can you know, be productive when we dwell in these little foxes. We know little foxes in this context refers to those sins, those attitudes, habits that we more often overlook, that we can excuse, that we can defend, that we can explain. Whereas they are very, very important because they have consequence on our journey with Christ. What are they? The first one, there are so many, but I'm going to focus within the short period of time that I have. Telling lies. Telling lies. That is very, very common. That is, we see it as simple, but it's very important. And there are Bible passages, you know, to support it. We all know what it means to tell lies. You know, when you do something and you tell lies to cover it, you know, once you begin to tell lies, you, you'll be telling so, uh, so other, some other lies to cover them. You know, it is a fact of lie that when you lie, you need another one, another lie to cover it. 
and it goes on and on until you exhort all the lies and you become exposed. And it can be very exposing. And we know that lying, you know, is so inconveniencing to an upright man. If you see an upright man, it's very difficult for him to lie. So what are the attributes of lies or liars? The first one is that liars are children of the devil. When you lie, you become a child of the devil. According to John chapter 8, verse 44. John 8, 44. Because of time, I'm not going to read it. You become a child of the devil. Another attribute is that destruction awaits liars. Destruction awaits liar. According to Proverbs chapter 19, verse 9. Proverbs 19, 9. Pro destruction awaits liar. And lastly, they won't make heaven. And it is my prayer that you and I will make heaven in the mighty name of Jesus. According to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Revelation 21, 8. Liar will not make heaven. And our journey, the whole purpose of our journey here on earth, you know, as Christians, is for us to rule and reign with God in heaven. And it is my prayer that we will not miss it in the mighty name of Jesus. Because of time, I have a case study here. I will just summarize. And that story is, can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 16. Where David learned of the death of Saul, you know, by that Amalekite uh, uh, boy. He got there and he lied to David that he was the one that killed Saul. Because Saul asked him to kill him. Whereas he wasn't the one. But what was his end, you know? Despite the fact that Saul was an adversary to David, Saul, you know, became so, so sad, you know, that he tore his dress. But what did he do to the Amalekite? You could, that can be found in verse um, 13 of that Bible passage. It said, then David said to the young man, who had brought the news? Where are you from? And he replied, I am a foreigner, an Amalekite, who lives in your land. Verse 14, David asked, why were you not afraid to kill the Lord's anointed one? David asked. Then verse 15, then David said to one of his men, kill him. So the man thrust his sword into the Amalekite and kill him. You have condemned yourself, David said, for you yourself confessed that you killed the Lord's anointed one. Lie. So what lessons can we learn from there? Lying can lead to destruction and eventually death. Lying can lead to destruction. Two, we are held accountable by the words we speak out of our mouth. So be careful not to exaggerate to make you look good because you'll be accountable. God will ask you. Three, respect the anointing upon any man of God, irrespective of what your perception of the man of God is. You know, despite the fact that Saul was, was, was running against David, seeking David to kill him. David never for once said that he wanted to disrespect the man. And any Loro, once you say a word, you know it's like a, an egg. So that is about wickedness, about um, lying. The second one, quickly, is wickedness. Wickedness. Things, because you know what wickedness is? Sinful acts. When you have evil intention, you know, do something very wicked to your fellow uh, brethren. Wickedness is generally considered a synonym for evil and sinfulness, you know, and it has the more specific meaning of a profound evil committed consciously of free will. If you are, a true, if you are truly a child of God that is or our heart has not been seared, the Holy Spirit will nudge our conscience as to whether what we have done or we are going to do are good and evil. As a child of God, you should know the difference between good and evil. You should know what is right and what is wrong. And be able to do that which is right. And be able to do that which is good if you have a conscience. But some people don't have a conscience. And quickly, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a case study as well. The same Second Samuel chapter 4. But this time from verse 5 to 12. Where Rechab and Benan thought they were doing David again a favor by killing the son of Saul, you know, Ish, Ish, Ish Boset. You know, they killed him and they went to David to tell him that, ah, we have avenged you of, um, of, um, of wrongdoing by, by, by Saul. But what did David do? He ordered his men to kill them. And 
he said that, so David gave an order to his men, and they killed them. They cut off their hands and feet, and hung the bodies by the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbotheth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. So, this is telling us, these people killed physically. But the question for you and I this morning is that, do we kill with our tongue? What do we say about others? Either behind them or behind them. So, God is telling us this morning that we should be mindful. We should not destroy another person with our tongues. We should be careful what we say. That is wickedness. How many times have you seek revenge? Even if the brethren has done any wrong to you, it is not enough justification for you to take a revenge. So the Holy Spirit is telling us this morning that to abide in Christ, we should not dwell in all these little foxes. And it is my prayer that God himself, through this word, will have spoken to some people and make them to repent of their sins in the mighty name of Jesus. So to abide in Christ, we need to learn forgiveness, no matter the wrong done to us. Our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, even despite what he went through, before he was hung on the cross of Calvary, his last word was, Father, forgive them. No matter what anyone might have done to you, learn to forgive. And as you do so, God will also forgive you in the mighty name of Jesus. Shall we just bow down our head and just ask God that in any way, you know, as the word has come, is there anything that it has not in your mind, in your heart, in your conscience, whether lies that you have told or wickedness that you have done to others? Just ask God for forgiveness. Ask God to have mercy on you in the mighty name of Jesus and ask him to help you to continuously abide in him in the mighty name of Jesus, so that he too can abide in you, so that you can bear fruit and bear much fruit in the mighty name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.